Well, you can go ahead and have a seat. It is good to be with you. My name is Robert, I'm one of the pastors here, and we want to welcome you. Uh, if you're watching in Parker today, we're excited to have you tuning in as part of our Calvary family. I was down in Parker uh, just a few days ago getting to walk uh, the building and see an update on the renovations, and uh, electricity's in, plumbing's in, walls are built, uh, stage is built, and it's uh, really excited. If you're in Parker, I'm sure you're excited. We're excited up here as well, uh, and uh, can't wait for that to be open and have a permanent facility down there. Now, uh, for for us here, we're jumping uh, back into our study in uh, kingdom relationships. So invite you to open to John chapter 11. It's where we're gonna be today. And uh, as always, if you don't have a Bible with you, feel free to use the Bible that's in the chair in front of you today. And uh, as you leave later on, you can take that with you. We want you to have the word of God in your home uh, so you can read and apply it. Now, we've been uh, in relationship study for uh, several weeks now, and I'm sure there's been some great things that have come from it. I know in our life group, there's been great conversations, great growth, a lot of uh, great realizations that have come through just taking some time to think about the, the relationships we have. But I also know that uh, whenever we spend an extended period of time talking about relationships, there's, uh, there's some, some negative that can come with that. There's some pain because uh, relationships don't always go well. And, and so maybe you're coming into this and you're like, can we wrap up and move on because there's some baggage that you're carrying with it. Maybe you're in a place where you've had some good friendships that have gone awry. Maybe you've had a marriage that ended in a painful divorce. Maybe you've got some estranged relationships with uh, some extended family or adult kids. Maybe you've just got a, a good friendship that uh, is not what it used to be. Or maybe it's not on that path where it's experienced destruction, but you're wondering, is it going to get there? My marriage, this relationship, this friendship's not what it could be. And so we're gonna kind of look at that a little bit, and I know this isn't maybe the, the most exciting lead into a sermon, but the passage we're gonna look at also isn't the most uplifting. It's a, a moment of difficulty that, that Jesus has to step into uh, and navigate through with his life. But, but we're looking at how we navigate those impossible situations. Because sometimes we can look at the relationships that we have and we, we say things like, it'll never change, or there's no way, or I could never forgive them. And we make these statements of impossibility, and maybe there's, there's this idea that uh, there's death associated with some of those situations, that it can never come back from. And as I was thinking about that and, and how we kind of assign these negative statements to relationships in our life, I was thinking about a statement I heard uh, when I was in seminary, actually. It was uh, in a class on pastoral ministry, and they're talking about church revitalization. And they used this statement, uh, the professor said, you, you have to understand that it's easier to give birth than raise the dead. And it, and it, it caught me, because I'm like, wait, what, what did he say? And he said it a couple times, it's easier to give birth than raise the dead, because he wanted us as students to understand if we were to step into a church revitalization situation where this church wasn't healthy and we were called to come in as the pastor to lead it back to a healthy place, it would be easier to just go start a new church. And, and I've seen that same statement come up in business and uh, I've even heard it get tossed around in relationships because I think we understand as humans how difficult change can be. And especially once something gets started down a path, how hard it is to get it redirected down a different path. But see, if, as followers of Jesus, if we too loosely kind of apply that ideology to the situations around us, I think it can cause us to do a couple of things. One, it can cause us to move on too quickly from a relationship or even just a situation where there's still potential, there's still value and an opportunity there. Essentially, it causes us to throw in the towel too easily. But secondly, I think if we walk around with that ideology too much, it can cause us to, to not factor in the power of God in our life. In those situations that seem impossible, like raising someone from the dead. And, and that's what we're gonna be looking at today. We're gonna be looking at just how God shows up in those impossible moments of our life, how God's power can exist in those situations where it might seem hopeless or impossible. Because while it might be true that it's easier to give birth than raise the dead, we're gonna see today that both are actually pretty simple for Jesus. So we're gonna look at John chapter 11. I'm gonna set us up, because uh, we're gonna start down at verse 17. I wanna set up the, the first part of that because, uh, it's following a story of, of a guy named Lazarus. Lazarus is a good friend of Jesus. And I think sometimes we forget that Jesus wasn't just this like vagabond who lived in the desert. He had relationships. He had friends and family and people he was close to. 
He didn't start his ministry until about 30 years of age, so he had 30 years of growing up in, in a town where he had friends and he knew people and he had family and, and deep relationships. And one of those close friends was a guy named Lazarus. And so chapter 11 starts with word being sent to Jesus that Lazarus was ill. And this isn't like, hey, your friend has the man cold. This is like, hey, he's not doing well. And some of you have had to make that call. Some of you have had to make the call where we say, hey, we don't know how much longer there is. You need to get here quick. Except for this situation, it was that plus a plea for help. They had heard the stories of Jesus. They had heard how he healed people who were ill. He, he restored sight to the blind. He restored walking to those that were paralyzed and lame. They had heard all these stories. So it was, hey, your friend is ill and may not make it, but also we know what your power is. We know that you can do something, so come help. But the beginning of chapter 11, we, we see that Jesus has sent this word, but then it says that he waited. Intentionally, he waited two days before starting the journey to go see them. And it, he's talking with the disciples that this is very intentional and he's got a plan in place, but we're gonna see that this is a source of conflict uh, for the family. So let's pick up verse 17 of John chapter 11. It says this, now when Jesus came, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Bethany was near Jerusalem, about two miles off. And many of the Jews had come to Mary and Martha to console them concerning their brother. So when Martha heard that Jesus was coming, she went out and met him, but Mary remained seated in the house. Martha said to Jesus, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask from God, God will give you. Jesus said to her, your brother will rise again. Martha said, I know that he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? She said to him, yes, Lord, I believe you are the Christ, the Son of God who is coming into the world. And when she had said this, she went and called her sister Mary, saying in private, the teacher is here and he's calling for you. And when she heard it, she rose quickly and went out to him. And Jesus had not yet come into the village, but was still in the place where Martha had met him. And when the Jews who were with her in the house consoling her saw Mary rise quickly and go out, they followed her, supposing she was going to the tomb to weep there. Now when Mary came to where Jesus was and saw him, she fell at his feet saying to him, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And when Jesus saw her weeping, the Jews who, were, who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. He said, where have you laid him? And they said to him, Lord, come and see and Jesus wept. So the Jews said, see how he loved him. But some of them said, could not he who opened the eyes of the blind man also have kept this man from dying? We're gonna come back to this passage and, and finish up the chapter, but I wanna pause there and just kind of process what we've seen so far. Because the, the sisters, Mary and Martha, are, are navigating all these emotions and all these things to process and, and, and they're struggling with the reality that Jesus was late. They had sent word to them. They had sent word to Jesus, come and heal your friend Lazarus, but Jesus showed up late. And now they're processing this and they're struggling and they're questioning Jesus and his motives because what we see through this is that failed plans can cause us to question God. God. See, Mary and Martha had never planned on their brother getting sick, but once they found out that he was, you gotta think that they've got a plan in place. It's like, okay, step one, let's send someone to find Jesus. We're gonna tell him how bad he is. Jesus is gonna come. It's probably gonna take him about this many days to get here. It gives us about this much time. And they had a plan. And so they find someone, they send him out to find Jesus, and they waited and waited and waited and as they waited, they watched their brother continue to get worse and worse. And we're not told exactly all the little details, but I can't help but wonder if the messenger came back without Jesus. I hope for his sake he didn't, because there's so many questions. If he came back without Jesus, they're like, well, where is he? Did you tell him how sick Lazarus was? Why isn't he coming? When is he gonna come? What's his plan? And that poor guy has no good answers. <laughs> He's just getting shot from every side as they're questioning why isn't Jesus doing what we're asking. 
and it didn't get any better because as they watched their brother get worse and eventually die, those questions got more pointed and painful as their plan didn't come to fruition. Jesus shows up four days after their brother had died and they're just wondering, why didn't you do what we asked? And see, for us, we often do the same thing. We often look at situations, we look at at these moments where our plans didn't come to fruition, where we experienced difficulties. Maybe we had a, a loved one die, maybe a relationship fell apart, maybe a situation didn't work out the way we wanted. We didn't get the job we were hoping for, or business failed, and we're like, where's God in the midst of this? Maybe, like Mary and Martha, we say things like, if God were real, this wouldn't have happened. Or maybe we play the comparison game like the, the, the strangers in the crowd here at the end and we go, man, God worked a miracle over here for this person, couldn't he have done the same thing over here? Because when our plans fall apart, it can cause us to question God. But if you notice, Jesus didn't ever engage with this line of reasoning. He never started to defend himself. He never went back and said, well, well, let's talk about this, let's process this. He never actually engaged with this line of reasoning because the Son of God and Savior of the world has no need to defend himself. See, he doesn't need to defend his motives, his plans, his agenda, because he knows they're perfect. And and that's the difficulty for us that we have to understand that that God is our heavenly father who loves us and scripture says he loves to give good gifts to his children. But he doesn't have to give us good gifts to prove that he is God. He's already proven himself through sending his son Jesus to die on the cross for us. He's already given us the greatest evidence for his existence, the greatest evidence for his love and goodness in our life. It's just that we want more. And we want it specifically how we want it in our agenda. But see, when we, when we start to question God and question his motives, it can cause us to, to forget that following him was never a promise that all the bad stuff goes away. And it can cause us to forget that, that God has a much bigger view of everything than we do. See, if we stay in the place of questioning God and his motives, it can cause us to underestimate the power of God in our life. And I think that's exactly what Mary and Martha did. They understood that Jesus had power. They understood that Jesus could heal people, that he could restore sight to the blind, that he could heal those who were crippled and sick. But they thought that that's where his power ended. And that's where their hopelessness sank in. Because they thought, well, as soon as my brother has died, all the hope of Jesus doing anything is now gone. But we see that's not the case. So let's pick back up verse 38 for the actual best part of this passage. Verse 38, it says, Then Jesus moved again, came to the tomb. It was a cave and a stone lay against it. And Jesus said, Take away the stone. Martha, the sister of the dead man, said to him, Lord, by this time there'll be an odor, for he's been dead four days. But Jesus said, Did I not tell you that if you believed, you would see the glory of God? So they took away the stone and Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you've heard me. But I know that you always hear me, but I said this on account of the people standing around that they may believe you sent me. And when he had said these things, he cried out with a loud voice, Lazarus, come out. And the man who had died came out, his hands and feet bound with linen strips, his face wrapped with a cloth. And Jesus said, unbind him and let him go. I would love to be a fly on the wall and watch this situation play out. I would love to see the looks and the faces of the people gathered there as they see Lazarus stumble out of the tomb, grave clothes all up, cloth over his face. I kind of imagine him stumbling out like a teenager that just got woken up at 5 a.m. They're just kind of like deliriously stumbling out. But a miracle took place there. And see, here's the amazing thing. Mary and Martha are frustrated because Jesus didn't do what they asked him to do. He didn't come and heal Lazarus of whatever illness he had because Jesus had a plan to do a much bigger miracle. He had a plan to level up the amazing thing that they were asking for. But their belief in Jesus didn't allow for this. They didn't think that it was possible once Lazarus had died. They didn't think that that was within the realm of possibilities there. They thought it was impossible. 
And so often we look at situations through that same lens of there's a point where it crosses over into impossible. And maybe for our relationships, there's some that we look at and we think there's no way this marriage can be restored. There's no way this friendship can be reconciled. There's no way I can reconcile with my kids or extended family. There's no way I can forgive that person or fix that friendship. And in a way, you're, you're right. Because if, if your hope for change, for reconciliation, for restoration is just in you, you're probably right that it's not possible. Because you're not factoring in the power of God to, to work in your situations, to work in these relationships. You're forgetting what Jesus said in Luke 18, the things which are impossible with men are possible with God. Because all those things that you think are impossible, all those situations that you think are hopeless and beyond help, are still possible for God. Restoration for your marriage is possible with God's power at work in you. Reconciliation with that friend or with that person is possible with God leading you in his ministry of reconciliation. Forgiveness is possible with God's grace flowing in your life. But it all comes back to the question that, that Jesus asked Martha, of, do you believe? I wanna go back and look once more at this, verse 23. I want us to look at this exchange one more time. Jesus is talking with Martha and he said to her in verse 23, your brother will rise again. But Martha said to him, I know he will rise again in the resurrection on the last day. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. Whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. And everyone who lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this? See, Jesus is telling her what's gonna happen. He's like, your brother will rise again. And he's like, in like three minutes, this is gonna happen. And she's like, I know, like when the world ends and you come back and everything, I know he's gonna resurrect then. And he's like, no, like in like two and a half minutes now, this is gonna happen. So when we look at this, I think we have to ask ourselves a question. And that is, do you believe that God can work in the here and the now? Because again, Martha was like, yes, I believe that it's possible for my brother to rise from the grave in the future, in the end of everything. I believe in the eternal hope that I have in you as my savior and what my brother believed in you as well. But again, that was a future power, not a present power for them. Martha was like, this is, this is possible in the future. I know that, that eternity is secure and I know that to be true but there's limitations on what Jesus could do right then and there. And I, I wonder if some of us do the same. If you're here and you believe that Jesus is the son of God and savior of the world, that he came to give you the hope of heaven for your eternity, praise God. And if you're not in that place of believing that, praise God that you're here. We're grateful that you're here, but we pray that at some point you would surrender your life to Jesus and find salvation in him. But if you're in that place where you say, I believe in Jesus, I believe in the hope of heaven, I believe that when I die, that is my destination, do you also believe that he has power in your life right now? Because I think too many of us think that we have to solve all the problems now and Jesus just solves the eternal problem in the future. And we forget one of the best news of following Jesus is that when we make that decision to give our life over to him, the third member of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit comes into our life. We're indwelled by God himself and he's there to lead us, to help us, to guide us, to teach us, but also to bring God's power to bear in our life. See, Romans 8 uh, verse 11 says, the same Holy Spirit who raised Jesus from the dead lives in us. And it goes on, it says, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you our mortal bodies right now, the, the life we're living right now, the Holy Spirit is coming into our life to give power, to give guidance, to bring hope, and to bring change into our life. And that same question that Jesus asked Martha, I think is pertinent for us, do we believe this? Are we believing that he has power to bring new life into situations that seem hopeless? Do we believe that he can resurrect relationships that have gone astray, that have, have gone into a place of destruction? And if we believe that, do our actions follow our belief? 
See, I think there's some, some actions that if we believe God has the power to work in the here and the now in our life that we're gonna be doing. And the first might seem a little obvious, but if we believe God has the power to work right here, right now in our life, the first thing that we need to be doing is praying for the situations that trouble us. And I know this seems like, okay, this is, this is all you got for me. Like, okay, maybe go back, take a few more seminary classes if that's all you got. But I don't know how many times I've talked with people and they're, they've got this situation that's burdening them. They're, they're worried, they're anxious, they're stressed, they're frustrated, they're depressed. But they haven't gone to God in prayer about it. And at some level, it makes sense. If we don't believe God has the power to change situations, why would we pray? It would be a waste of time and energy to do so. But God indeed does have the power to change, to work, to change situations, so why aren't we taking it to him in prayer? So let me challenge you, whatever situation seems impossible, that seems hopeless, that seems to be burdening you and weighing down, pray about that. Daily, go to God and pray for your marriage. Pray for that relationship that's broken. Pray for that estranged family member. Pray for that situation that needs forgiveness and reconciliation. See, that's the reason that that word was sent to Jesus in the beginning of chapter 11 about Lazarus, because they believed that Jesus could do something. If we believe that Jesus can do things in our life, let's send word to him that we want him to work in that situation as well. So we need to pray for those situations. Secondly, I think we need to actively seek to be obedient to him in those areas. See, when you're reading through this, I don't know if you catch the frustration that Jesus has towards the end of this account. They're there in front of the tomb and they say, oh, he, he instructs them, open up the tomb because he knows what's gonna happen. I need the tomb to be open so that Lazarus can like walk out. But they're like, no, Jesus, like, you don't wanna do that. Like, it's gonna smell bad. And he's like, I bet it won't. Um, but they're like, they're basically, they're in this like mild argument and he's like, I want you to do this. And they're coming up with reasons why they don't want to. And internally, I, I, I pictured Jesus like, are you guys kidding me? I'm trying to do what you're asking me here and you're not listening. And I wonder how often I do the same in my own life. How often we do the same where we go, God, I want you to, to work in this situation. I want you to bless my life. And he's like, are, are you gonna follow my plan then? Are you gonna do what I've instructed you to do? How often we look and we say, God, I, I want you to, to bless my marriage, I want you to heal things, but are we willing to, to swallow our pride and sacrificially love and serve our spouse the way he's called us to? We say, God, I want you to, to restore this relationship, I want you to, to heal this thing that's broken, and he says, okay, are you willing to forgive them as I've forgiven you? God, I want you to to bless this relationship that I have with my significant other. And he's like, okay, then you need to follow my plan for marriage and sexuality if you want me to bless it. I wonder how often we're asking God to bless our life while trying to do our plan instead of his plan. And I think that oftentimes blessing is waiting on the other side of obedience in our life. So if we believe that God can work in the here and now, we need to be praying for these situations. We need to be seeking to walk in obedience to him. And we need to be trusting God with the outcome. And this is the one that none of us actually want to apply or think about. And you get a little bit of this from Martha. And she, when, at the beginning, she says, if you would have been here, my brother wouldn't die. But she says, but I believe that God will give you whatever you ask. There's that little glimmer of hope that she has and that submission of, I don't know how this is gonna play out, but I'm gonna trust you. And see, we can, we can look in at all the different ways that God can change, that God can work, that God can heal and redeem. And I wish I could stand up here and just say, if you just prayed harder and had more faith and believed better that everything you desired would come to bear. But I can't do that. Because I know that, that God's plans are, are bigger than our plans I know that sometimes God doesn't change what he wants to do simply because of our desires. And there's all kinds of reasons why God doesn't work in situations. Sometimes we're asking for things that aren't good for us. We pray diligently and we think it's great, but God's like, no, you don't get it. This isn't going to bless you. Sometimes God doesn't work in situations because we receive forgiveness for our sins, but we have to live with the earthly consequences of them. Sometimes God doesn't grant us our requests 
because we just have to see the up close and personal reminder that our world isn't what it should be. It's broken in need of hope and a savior who is Jesus. But in the end, we have to trust that God is good, that he knows what he's doing, even if what we want to happen doesn't happen. And we have to trust that even in those cases, God is still good and still worthy of our worship. And we also have to remember that even if what we want to happen here on earth doesn't happen, we still have the hope of heaven. It's that balance of our our present hope and that future hope as well. Where we remember the words of Jesus when he said, whoever believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. See, when we remember that our eternity is sealed in Jesus, that we have the hope of heaven, it helps us navigate the pain and disappointment here on earth because this isn't everything for us. But when we forget that heaven is our destiny, that, that Jesus has brought that hope to us, that our situations here become a lot more significant. They become a lot heavier, a lot more painful when we lose sight of the eternal scope of our life. But the good news is that when we've put our faith in Jesus, we have the hope of heaven. We have that eternal destination that's been secure. But it comes back to the question that Jesus asked, do you believe this? Do you believe that God has the power to change your life? See, I believe this and I've seen it over and over again in my life and the people around me and people in ministry when they get to share their story of how God transformed and changed their life, how God redeemed situations that were impossible. But it comes back to each and every one of us if we believe this ourselves, If we believe that God has the power to change, to bring new life, to redeem situations that seem impossible. Because what we see is nothing is impossible with God. And I pray that you would believe this and that you would see God's power change and transform your life. Let's pray together. God, I thank you that you are a God who does the impossible in our life. I thank you that you love us, that you sent your son Jesus not just to share this moment that we get to look at and reflect on, but that you sent your son Jesus to save us. God, the most important evidence of your goodness and your uh, perfect planning is the life, death, and resurrection of your son, Jesus. And I pray that you would remind us of that and the hope that it brings in our life, both in the present reality of how you have the power to do anything, but also that we have heaven as our destiny. God, I know that, that this world can lead us to places of pain and brokenness and despair, So I pray that you would remind us of the joy and hope and purpose of following you. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen.